with this uh, crowd of folks. Welcome to physical plus digital equals new business models. The physical real world and the digital worlds are colliding. I think this is just a fact of life for anyone who was born after 1990 or so, but I'm gonna guess for most of the folks in the, in the room, we're still trying to figure out exactly what this means and, and how this changes business models. And the folks that you see up here are on the leading edge of this change and will be here really to talk to us about what they see and what they expect to come next. I'm generally someone who tries to keep my physical world and my digital world very, very separate. Um, but I, attending F8 a few weeks ago, I was actually reminded about how much these worlds are intertwined and a lot of times without us even realizing it. Um, the whole F8 conference was a showcase of how the physical world and the digital world are colliding. Take a picture, scan a badge, your picture automatically gets posted on your Facebook page. That one's fairly obvious. But the next example actually turns that on its head where you take something that happens in the digital world where I, for example, posted my musical likes and then that affects my physical world where they would take my musical likes and actually put it on the playlist for F8. But I think the best thing about how physical and digital worlds are colliding is how it helps people make connections. A couple thousand people at F8 um, and somebody reaches out to me, uh, a friend who I hadn't spoken to in a, in, in a number of months, reaches out to me and says, hey, I saw that you had checked in at F8. I'm here too. Let's connect up. My name is Mary Ku, and I lead the digital goods product management team here at PayPal. I'll be your moderator for this panel. But before I introduce our, our really great speakers, I wanted to get a little bit of, of a sense of who's in the audience. Um, so can I just ask you guys to raise your hands as I ask these questions. Um, so if you're a developer, can you raise your hand? Okay, a few folks in the audience. If you're a brand or a retailer who's trying to figure out how you do this online thing, a couple of folks. Are you, who's contemplating a project to try to connect up physical and digital? And who already has projects live? Okay, great, thank you for that. And hopefully that will help us tailor some of our responses and answers. Um, so now on to our panelists. So I'm going to start from the end here. Um, first we have John Martin, who is the Digital Marketing Director for NASCAR. And I'm going to let each of, uh, each of our speakers and our panelists introduce themselves. So John, do you wanna give us a quick um, yeah, John Martin. I work with uh, NASCAR in their digital division. Um, NASCAR, as you may know, or if you guys are fans or not fans, by the way, I did put my sponsor front and center. <laughs> I want to thank Coca-Cola for being with us today. Cars running great. Um, you know, the thing about people don't realize about NASCAR is we do probably 1,200 races um, at over 100 tracks in the U.S. So it's not just the Sprint Cup and the Jeff Gordon and Jimmy Johnsons. We do racing all across America. Somewhere someplace in rural America on a weekend there is a NASCAR sanctioned race going on um, and that's really what we do is continue to grow. In the words of Richard Petty, the first car race happened when the second car came off the assembly line. That's the day the first race started. Um, brand loyalty to us is incredible. Uh, again, if you do know the sport or don't know the sport, NASCAR is really all about who that driver is, what company is sponsoring my driver. Fans make the connection between the fact that that company is paying for my guy that I like to race, so I'm going to support that company. It's one of the uh, best things about NASCAR. It's better than any other sport out there. So people will go and buy Tide because Tide sponsors their driver. Um, again, if you go to a NASCAR race or been to a NASCAR race, we regularly put over 100,000 people. We put over 200,000 people at a venue in Daytona. Uh, Florida every February, uh, some of the biggest events in America, all NASCAR races, and our television ratings. You know, people talk about, oh, the NFL and how great the ratings are, and they are truly a ratings juggernaut, but as number two sport, um, you know, we joke that our rain delays outrate any NBA game or baseball game for the most part, because people want to see what's going on. Again, that's part of our national footprint. Um, and of course, we are, have more of an international presence than people think. So NASCAR as a brand has tried to take what we are as a sport, which is truly American, and then say, okay, what does it mean for the virtual world? And so for us, we're still uh, a sports league that likes to tiptoe into things and understand it, but the virtual world of car racing for us uh, has been very interesting for us to understand what uh, people want to do 
in this virtual world. Uh, and we've had a couple of key projects. We can talk about that later. But as far as NASCAR is and what we do, we are uh, highly interested in this area. We've dipped our toe and we've got a few key projects, but we'll talk about those as we go. Um, and next we have Maura Welch, who's the Director of Marketing for Re We World, which is a virtual world for kids and tweens. Um, so WeWorld is a social entertainment company. That's how we like to think of ourselves. And we offer both online and mobile apps that help youth and mainstream audiences give their, uh, use their voices and express themselves. This is a Weemi. This is my Weemi. You can tell from my Weemi that I'm a, uh, from Boston. I'm a Celtics fan. Um, if you want to switch the slide. Um, basically, um, over 50 million Weemis have been created to date um, on WeWorld.com and our partner sites, which include AIM, Skype, MSN, as well as our mobile apps. Um, we have both iPhone and Android apps. Um, and we also partner with brands such as um, uh, brands and artists. Um, we monetize our site in two ways, one through the sale of virtual goods. And you can see some of the virtual goods that are used here. So um, Snoop Dogg, for example, is on our site. You can buy Snoop Dogg's double dogs um, and his gold chains and all of that stuff. So we um, monetize both that way and also through advertising. So if you want to switch to the next slide. We also, um, Coca-Cola is in the room again. <laughs> um, Coca-Cola can come on our site. And um, the model there is that um, uh, they pay us as, a, as an advertiser, and we give these virtual goods for free to, um, to the end users on WeWorld.com. Um, we actually see ourselves at the intersection of three really key trends, if we're talking about trends here. One is the mobile apps business, which is a $15 billion industry and growing. The social advertising business, which is a $3 billion, depending on how you slice the pie, part of the online marketing space, and the virtual goods, which is a $12 billion industry. So, we're really poised to be focused on the mainstream um, uh, audience. WeWorld is basically a 13 to 17 year old uh, website for a um, very popular top 10 site for US teens. Okay. Thanks. Thank you, Maura. Next, we have Dan Jansen, who's the CEO of Virtual Greats, which helps entertainers extend, the, extend their brand into the virtual world. Yeah, I think we're we going to start with a little video. Video, yes, that we've got going. We're not. We're not. <laughs> Did I pause it again? No. It's having an issue though. We couldn't get through this without some technical difficulty. <laughs> no, there it's moving now. Should I go a cappella? <laughs> One more try. Let's All right, see. We'll Hold on. Try. One more try. It's really cool. <laughs> I can hear it trying, but it's a bit warmer. Three minutes. All right, Dan. I think <laughs> we're going to have to. Yeah, I think you're going to have to go a cappella. Sorry. Well, boy, you should have seen this video. Um, it's actually on our website if you want to take a look. Our company was founded by on a basic question that we couldn't get a good answer to: uh, Why was virtual goods the only new product category we had ever seen that doesn't have a brand or an intellectual property uh, presence? 
Uh, a related question is why does online advertising, that $20 billion market, not employ virtual versions of real products that offer higher levels of engagement and authenticity to the user to measurably deliver against their brand promises from the real world? I'll go into that a little bit later. We couldn't find a good answer. Omnicom, the advertising conglomerate, provided some seed capital, and Virtual Greats was born. Our mission is very simple. Uh, we help brands monetize uh, in social media. We now have over 200 brands and we define them fairly broadly. Um, people love to talk about one of our product lines, the celebrities, and that's where we have the Snoop Dogs and Paris Hilton and Raven Simone and, and you, you name them. Uh, but our larger product lines are intellectual property portfolios, that's sports leagues like the NBA, all the players, all the teams, um, major league soccer, 50 Division I colleges, Warner Brothers television shows, from Gossip Girl to Big Bang Theory, Universal Film Library, Universal Music. Our third product line are fashion uh, lines, Rockaware, Volcom, uh, Cynthia Raleigh, Skechers, etc. We also, on the other side of our model, have 25 social media partners, virtual worlds, casual games, and social networks. And we basically offer two things. One are branded virtual goods, BVGs. That's what the uh, end user will pay for. Kind of think analogous to TV. That's pay TV. They pay a dollar. We'll talk about what they're buying and why. The other is an integrated virtual good campaign. That's advertiser funded, kind of like free TV. That's where the advertiser will pay to insert the virtual goods into our distribution network and have those items be taken by the users for free. So uh, today's about physical to digital. Um, we kind of play across the different markets. We'll talk about how we play in the four-ish billion dollar virtual goods market that is very attractive margins. Brands should be in it. Uh, we play increasingly in the $20 billion online advertising market. Uh, you should be getting greater efficacy and authenticity there. And at the end of the day, it's about driving sales in the $8 trillion real world physical um, product market. Thank you, Dan. And last we have Linda Bustos, who's the founder of Elastic Commerce, which is an e-commerce consulting firm that does a lot of work with digital goods. Okay, well that pretty much sums it up. <laughs> um, I work with Elastic Class Software. It's, a, it's a, an enterprise e-commerce platform which is actually focused completely on um, digital goods. Most of our customers, if not all, are doing something with, the, with digital goods. and. Um, Part of my job is to write three times a week for a blog called Get Elastic E-Commerce Blog. So um, what I cover is really the marketing and the merchandising and the store operations side of online selling. Great. Thank you. Um, so and you all are on slightly different sides of the equation when we think about this physical and digital world colliding question. Um, can you talk a little bit about some of the different models that you've seen for how to put these two pieces together? And maybe we'll start with Linda at the end there. Sorry, could you repeat the question? <laughs> um, what are some of the models that you've seen for how to put the physical and digital together? Okay. Well, I think that, um, you know, the different models you can have, you can be a pure play digital retailer or you could have physical goods that have a digital companion. So, for example, you're selling, um, maybe you're selling antivirus software, but you are now offering the download, the upgrade, the extra features, the complementary product or a, a mobile application, that kind of thing. Uh, so that would be a mixture of physical and digital goods. Or you could go 100% digital. All you sell is uh, subscription access to video content or membership or purely just, um, you know, virtual products that can be consumed on devices. And Dan, maybe you can talk a little bit about this as well from the, the yeah. brand and virtual world perspective. Yeah, and the, from the virtual goods perspective, we kind of integrate the two in two basically different ways. One is a more enhanced, effective advertising model. Um, you know, that $20 billion of online ad spend out there, a dirty little secret is that the ROI isn't what many of our brands would like it to be. Um, it's relatively passive, the display and the banner stuff in particular. Virtual goods can become a 3D representation of the product that the user integrates into their online persona and it, you can measurably deliver against the brand promise from the real world. And let me put that in English. Let's say we're working with our friends at Skechers and a virtual version of their shape-up shoes actually improves your avatar's body shape during the play se session. 
or uh, you increase, the, you change the game mechanics such that wearing those shoes makes you run a little faster in a game where speed counts, or you improve your shooting percentage. Again, that's a much more authentic, compelling, integrated impression at frankly a lower cost. The other way physical and digital integrate is a more direct driving of the sales. You know, I, I talked about the indirect model. When that shoe makes me look a little better, when I'm in the store that weekend, I've enhanced the brand equities in my mind, maybe subconsciously, such that I might pick those Skechers off the shelf. There's more direct ways where it increases awareness, um, especially for products that are seasonal in nature. Uh, we're working with uh, Warner Brothers TV shows. Gossip Girls is on 20 weeks of the year. Their fans can interact with that brand year round. We can, we're selling 30 year old film items from Scarface. You can bring the products back to life. You can keep them relevant year round. NBA can be relevant and uh, awareness up off season. There's probably even a, 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 a firmer connection where we're driving traffic. We're connecting between uh, sending people from the real world in store uh, fan bases into the virtual worlds and casual games uh, and vice versa. And then finally the most direct application is where we're actually bundling physical product with virtual product where you know, hang tags on a plush doll in a real world store can send you into a world with some kind of a discount and or when you buy a virtual world you know, later in a gifting environment that product can show up, the real version of that product can show up on your door. So we see them being very tightly integrated and driving sales directly in a lot of different ways. And I think we're going to get into some more examples in a bit. I was going to say, I, you know, I think a lot of the models that you guys are talking about are somewhat theoretical, the way that we talk about them in, in the abstract. And um, maybe you guys could talk about what you consider to be your, your most iconic project to date and kind of help bring to life for the audience what this really means. Um, Maura, do you want to start? start? Yeah, I think. One thing for me, I mean, you let off talking about how we're living in a very digital environment now. And it's, you know, I'm, we work with kids all the time who don't see a difference. I mean, they know that they're online, but they don't see a real concrete difference between their online and their offline. So when they come to, um, you know, in the real world, they expect to be able to choose their brands and choose what they like and express themselves. And they expect the same when they come to the virtual side. Um, so I think that model really works. And so one of the things, uh, probably our most iconic one actually, surprisingly, is Snoop Dogg, who, you know, Snoop Dogg, God love him, he's like amazing. He just never keeps on going, keeps on delivering. And um, people know him as Snoop Dogg and know him as his style and his fashion. And one of the most popular things we've ever done, actually partnering with Dan um, and Virtual Greats, is to bring Snoop Dogg and his double Doberman dogs to WeWorld because it's one of the most popular and most iconic things that Snoop's got. And we did a calculation where um, we count, like you can be a friend of Snoop Dogg's on WeWorld and he's got a whole bunch of friends. And if I take the number of people that have actually bought the Snoop Dogg, I come up with about 33% of the fans of, of, the, of people that have friended him have also purchased an item from Snoop. That's just an astounding number. And it has to do with the fact that it not only is popular virtual good, but it's, um, it's Snoop. So there's, there's a bit of both in there. But yeah, we're, just, we're definitely seeing a model where um, you know, other brands that we work with or other celebrities we work with like Cody Simpson or Grace and Chance will see more of a 3% kind of uh, transition to paid virtual goods. But um, if you've got a hit, you've got a hit. And one of the things that we were talking about um, earlier was the fact that I'm guessing a lot of, well, I don't know, a lot of people in this room maybe have never purchased a virtual good or maybe not even participated in a virtual world. And I have to admit that when I first started looking into this space, I was asking, why in the world am I buying a tractor in Farmville? Who does this? Um, and so maybe you can tell us a little bit about why, why people are doing it and who's buying. Yeah, well, I'm happy to yeah. jump in. Well, you're being polite. The first question is, what are they buying? And then why are they buying it? And is it real? Um, you know, what they're buying is avatar player customization, space customization. Uh, and why they're buying it, we see really four purchase drivers out of ascending price points. At the lowest level is just the aesthetic and the personal statement. 16-year-old girls in the real world want to look cute. 16-year-old girls in the virtual world want to look cute. They want to differentiate themselves. The next higher price point is for affiliation. You know, I, I went to UCLA. I could get a perfectly good sweatshirt from The Gap for 20 bucks. I pay $60 to have those four letters on my, my chest. And so people pay higher for that. The next higher price point is... Um, 
is, is gifting. People pay more maybe in a, uh, a dating uh, network uh, for gifts to get someone else's attention for their birthday than they do for themselves. And the prize in our space is the, high, the fourth purchase driver, which is functionality. When the item actually does something, um, our average price points can become five, ten, fifteen, twenty dollars. You know, it could be as simple as an NBA basketball that the avatar dribbles, dribbles wandering around the world. It could be one of our Rockaware outfits in a skiing game we have, where uh, the, the skier goes a little faster or spins a little quicker. So th this distinction between what's real and what's not, you know, it's, it, it, it troubles the, the older folks like us in the room, but it, as Maura said, it's one that really doesn't resonate with the younger folks who see that online environment as a socialization platform, they're mainstream, uh, it's just part of who they are. We have, uh, I, I could probably go back on a couple of the questions you have. Uh, yeah, we struggle at NASCAR with how much of what we're doing in this virtual world is for marketing and how much is for commerce. And so that's the fine line we ask ourselves every day and what's right and what's not right. So when we get into our projects, it's okay, is this person doing something in this virtual world that we like? So in one of our platforms, which is Car Town, uh, which is a virtual NASCAR racing world, um, for you to go in and you know, earn something, you may have to go watch a video of a trailer of something we want you to watch. Or we might figure we have people who might not be NASCAR fans. You have to go watch a NASCAR 101 video. So we do a lot of things in our environment. So if you were to click there, the next slide. So here's the world. If you click in there, you say, oh, watch the video. If you watch the video, then you can get more things. And we want you to watch that video that comes up. Or we want you to then go to NASCAR.com. So we do a lot more things to do marketing on this space than anywhere else. Um, what we've also found, though, is, of course, there is the microtransactions model, and the people who want to identify with their driver um, will pay something to, uh, I guess our analogy here is, and I'm going to go uh, into the next question, you know, when you buy a physical good, there is a need. You're feeling a need. I want that hat. I want that shirt. I need it for this specific purpose. In our virtual world, in the research we've done, it's more, um, our analogy is you're giving like a, a cookie to a kid. You know, the kid's annoyed. Here, just take a cookie and don't embarrass mommy in the store. Um, I'm playing this game and I just don't want to take the time. I want to just get to the end. I want to know how to figure that thing out. So the microtransaction gets them where they want to go faster and that's how we found we can, we can make money or get a fee doing that, but we don't want to do that too much to annoy someone who's playing what we consider a NASCAR game that I've got to pay more and more and more. NASCAR is so greedy. So we walk that fine line. So the business model for us is probably still focused on marketing right now in the virtual world um, and not so much on commerce. The other thing we find is someone who is in the virtual world who then is racing the Jimmy Johnson car, the emotional connection that they are making is what you want with a brand. It's even deeper than the, well, I want to wear that hat. You know, that is an outward showing that I'm a fan of his, but in that virtual world, you literally are living him, you're, you're uh, connecting with that brand. You're saying, I wish I was in that car racing. Um, so those are the things, the business model we struggle with, and those are the reasons we find people want to want to do it. The last thing I'll throw in there, the next iteration for us, that iconic idea for us is going to be, you know, what we call the 44th car. There's 43 cars in every NASCAR race. Can we get a virtual car in a race that you can actually play? Can you do that in real time? I don't know if that's possible yet. We have some people working on that. Um, but can you do it after the race is over? Can someone come in in a car in the middle of a race that's already happened, the real race, the video they take, now you've made that into a, a virtual world, and can you put a car in there, and can that car react with the other cars as if, as if it was happening in the real time? We think that is something uh, every NASCAR fan wants, everyone wants. It's a classic merging of what really happened on the track with putting me in there in the virtual world. So those are kind of things we're trying to get to. That's how we see it coming together. And it sounds like NASCAR is doing some really quite creative things and thinking about how to bring the brand online. And I, I'm we, curious. Well, we don't do it. We get smart people like these people to do it for us. We don't do it. But some I'm, people do it for us, yes. I'm curious whether, was it a struggle to get NASCAR to think about these things, or was it a very natural conversation within the company um, to, to oh, think gosh. about it? Oh, gosh. You know, I, I'll say here's another thing. For any people working with brands out there, the biggest hurdle we have had um, and it's part inherent to our sport, but I imagine it's, it, it applies to all my business career. Organizing your intellectual property as a brand into one place becomes critical. You have to have someone who has all of their intellectual property organized in a manner you can use it. Um, you know, probably the bigger iconic project for NASCAR is we built our own 
Media Group, our own media facility in Charlotte, North Carolina. Uh, we invested tens of millions of dollars to take every old race, bring it in, tapes off a shelf, turn them into um, digital files, and that now has opened up a lot of things for us and a lot of business opportunities we didn't have. Um, same with the data that comes out of the cars. That's something we have that most sports don't have. What comes out of that car, the data is unbelievable. And the way we track it now, done by some, again, some guys here out of Silicon Valley, it's just amazing what we can pull out of that car. And I'm amazed at how consumers can take this data and want more of it. Um, and so getting all of that intellectual property in a usable format, in an organized manner where you know where it is, where someone can actually go on a computer and say, hey, show me Dale Earnhardt Sr. at Talladega at this time, and I want to see if I can work with that, um, is probably the biggest thing we've done and we continue to do because that's we're trying to make the old races back in the beaches in 1950 the same as the stuff we pull out of in-car cameras today. Uh, that's probably the, the biggest right. challenge I think you have is to getting it all in one spot. Right. And one, one of the things you were sharing, just the sheer amount of data must be, must be massive. You were saying that there are 43 cameras. 43 cars, in-car yeah. cameras. You know, yeah. 10 years ago, less than 10 years ago, when a race was over, you'd get maybe 4 to 12 hours of footage from that track coming back. We now take in over 120 hours of footage. Um, as you can imagine, cameras get cheaper, uh, fiber networks allow us, satellites allow us to take a whole lot more in, but then of course now you have to store it, you have to put meta tagging on it, and you have to put it in a format that you then can use it. So uh, again, I was telling them, we don't cover a, a, a hundred yard field, we've got two miles and 43 things interacting with each other that we have to cover with cameras, so it gets a little, a little crazy at times, right. but it's, it's a lot of data to then, again, take, put into usable format so we then can, can take advantage of, of the virtual worlds that are out there because that's really where people are going. Okay. Um, changing direction a little bit, I, I think there are probably a lot of folks in the audience who are quite familiar with physical goods retail and, and what that means. Um, and one of the things that we have been talking about was just how digital goods retail differs from physical goods and, and what do you have to think about and what are some of the pitfalls. Um, maybe, Linda, can you maybe start out by, by helping us understand what some of those differences might be? Sure. So I'll just put a small definition on, on digital goods. This can also not just include virtual products in a, in a virtual world, but also stuff we're familiar with like MP3s, um, streaming video, ebooks, software, all that kind of thing. So the difference from a technological standpoint really is that the digital goods are not like retail goods where they have a stock keeping unit, where there's a cost of goods sold, where there's shipping, where there's uh, you know inventory management, all that kind of thing. Basically what you have around a physical good, with around a digital good are entitlements. You know, who can purchase this product? Where can they use it on? What types of devices? Uh, are they buying the good to own forever? Are they subscribing? Are they buying a piece of the product? Are they buying a certain tier of access? Um, how many users will be able to have access to this? All of this metadata needs to be attached to the product. And, um, and that can get a little bit complicated because if you are shopping for technology, it's, it's, we, had years and years and years of just physical goods. So a lot of the functionality that you might need doesn't exist yet and might require being built. Another uh, caveat with, um, with selling physical goods alongside with digital goods is how you manage that in your catalog. Are they going to be completely separate products or are they one product page with all the different ways that you can buy them? So this might require a complete re-architecture of, of the way that your system works. And then finally, another caveat that happens is um, can your shopping cart actually handle a mixed cart with digital and physical goods? Amazon is, a, is an example that, of a cart that can't. So if you want to buy a digital MP3 and a physical gadget, um, you'll have to s check out separately. And one of the reasons could be because taxation rules, for example, maybe um, the tax has to be added to a billing address and not a shipping address because a shipping address doesn't exist and, and various nuances like that. But it does introduce quite a bit of complexity to the way that your system works. Yeah, if I could just pile in sure. a little bit, I mean, uh, 
there are some similarities, but there are a lot of differences you have to be aware of. And then just focusing on virtual goods in particular, you know, one thing I love is the, the product, the unit economics are very attractive. The, the marginal cost of creating an additional item is, is very low, let's just say. So if you're not used to 90 percent plus gross margins, you may, you may struggle with the space. Uh, the other thing is, you know, I love meeting with brands and saying, you know, all of your headaches, most of your headaches you have about inventory, you know, just forget about them. A certain celebutant who shall remain nameless couldn't get over the fact that, well, what do you do with the returns? I go, well, we don't have returns, you know, because her genes kept ending up on folks in, in certain countries. And so th there's some basic differences, you know, shelf space. You know, if your skew velocity is down, Walmart will take you from 24 inches to 18 inches. Our shelf space is, is, is server capacity. So you can kind of keep selling these items, keeping them on the shelf for incredible periods of time. The rights issues conflict between physical and digital. You know, if you're, we're selling some studio product, well, you can sell this show in Italy. Well, this darn internet, you know, crosses borders pretty easily. So the rights uh, between the physical and the digital versions of products can be kind of um, different. Uh, brands are very concerned about altering the product. In the real world, I could buy um, a, a garment and do things to it that are inappropriate and wander around. Can't do much. Brands are funny that way, how they kind of try to protect it. <laughs> as, they brands, what a as they should be. I think 90 plus percent of the platforms we look at, uh, we will not sell brands in because they can't prevent alter alteration, duplication. Uh, and things like that. So we always tell brands to be very careful. That's one reason they work with, with, with folks like us. Um, so there are some different cost of sales. Cost of sales can be up to 30 percent. In the real world, they're nowhere near that. So there's some benefits, there's some concerns, um, there's some differences uh, that you really need to think through. Great. Thanks. Um, what we wanted to do now was actually open, um, open up the mic to any questions from the audience. We've got... Is, Gotham, can you, Mike, I think we had a gentleman here in the check shirt. And um, for, those, for those who are asking questions, if you can tell us just a little bit about who you are and, and kind of are you a developer, what your interest is um, uh, in the subject, that would be great as you ask the question. How you doing? My name is Isaac. I work for La Cologne Coffee Roaster. I do the development of all our uh, websites and this kind of thing. And we're looking into doing some, uh, with coffee, we do a lot of philanthropy. We give back a lot, kind of like that one for one a little bit on uh, some of our projects. And I'm wondering, how, what do you guys think the room is for philanthropy and virtual goods? Like, you know, real world effects by, by just buying something in the, you know, like, do you guys think there's room for that? I mean, with such a high margin of, uh, you know, there's got to be. I can weigh on that. Good. Yeah. In fact, um, the teenagers are actually very altruistic. They're not all out there just like playing stupid games. They're actually talking to each other about real issues. <clears throat> we have um, worked with reachout.com um, to help put teens in touch with anti-bullying resources and created virtual goods that map to homegrown anti-bullying task force on our site. Um, we have done ad campaigns with the truth about the dangers of smoking, and that came completely immersive with a virtual world that was all about the truth, um, a custom game, custom virtual goods, um, you know, custom quizzes, that kind of stuff. And I think Dan touched on it before about what's really unique about being able to work in that virtual space is it's very different than like a banner or whatever. It's super immersive, and these kids can not only adopt these virtual items, but they can also then sort of be the brand ambassador or the message ambassador to all of their friends. Super powerful way. It's not, the, it's not like somebody telling you what you should do. It's your friends telling friends what to do. So I think there's a lot of uh, traction there. Yeah, and the, the only thing I'd add is that the microtransaction economies that are built and enabled, their wallets are loaded, and low price points really, uh, really facilitate, you know, the, the micro giving model. You know, where if you ask a kid for 10 bucks, they might say no. If you ask them for uh, 50 cents, especially if you're doing it via an alternative currency that kind of masks price points, you know, don't give me 50 cents, give me 27 acorns or 100 horseshoes. Uh, they're very predisposed to that. You know, we did a campaign with Domo, one of our top selling, selling brands, uh, benefiting the tsunami relief uh, in Japan, and we're we're very impressed with the response. Um, so, 
the short answer is I think there's a lot of opportunity. It takes a willing distribution partner. Not everyone's as, as noble and philanthropic as, as Mora and her team. Uh, and it takes often a, a brand that's recognized uh, because the users are ready for you. I've seen this too with my own uh, credit card company, right? I build up loyalty points, which is kind of like a virtual currency. And then, you know, one of the options is to donate to Tsunami Relief or Red Cross. Yeah. Yeah. Great. Next question. We have one up here. Actually, we've got two up here, so one after the other. Hi, my name is Tom. I work for eBay. I'm a developer. Uh, could you talk a little bit about demographics? I imagine that there are certain uh, groups of users that are very resistant to the sort of products that you offer. I just wondered if you guys have tried experiments trying to get older people to use your products. Um, you know, just uh, you know, how, how have you gotten traction among the older, the older users? Um, uh, it's funny. People ask us about demographics, and to me, demographics are kind of, um, you know, I, I, Nielsen to me, because that's television, you know, you put these people in these large groups. We focus more on psychographics. So for me, um, you know, NASCAR does tend to have a, an older audience because, again, the car culture of the 50s and 60s are really the people who put NASCAR where they are. Um, but for us, it's more the psychographics. It's what they're thinking about and what the reasons that they're doing it that we focus on. Uh, and I kind of touched on it earlier. The emotional connection we find with people in a virtual world who then feel like they're part of it and what that then uh, says to them about NASCAR and then wanting to go and purchase a ticket or then wanting to really support their driver in a more open format uh, by wearing a hat or by, by talking about NASCAR and how much they like it um, are the things we focus on. So we look more for the, um, the actions people will take while they're in that virtual world. So I don't know if that answers your question. That's more, more what we focus on. And, and getting people to actually take an action as opposed to their age or their gender or their, their ethnicity. It's interesting. We have uh, WeWorld.com is the kind of place you'd go if you want to interact with other teenagers. Obviously, kids are, are interested in that. Adults like Weemies, too. <laughs> and um, our audience on AIM is much older. Our audience on Skype is much older. Um, and what we're also finding is that um, on our mobile device, kids really, really love it because there's not a social element there, so it's very, very safe to just play and make weemies and email them and Facebook them and do whatever you do. Um, but what we're finding is that moms and dads really love the app because it is a pass-back app. You know, kids in the car bothering you, you pass the app back, say, make some weemies. <laughs> so it, it's not like, um, so I think because we're a cartoon character, you know, I think that we definitely look like we trend younger, but. It, pretty much we need to make you smile across the board, so mm. it's interesting. Yeah, the one, the one thing I'd add to that is a few years ago when we started the company and I said, hey, do you want to sell virtual goods and social media? The answer was, huh, and what? Um, now I think there's been a mainstreaming of obviously social media. You don't have to explain Facebook or, you know, everyone's got a page or casual gaming, their neighbors on Farmville or virtual worlds, their kids are on Clump Penguin. Uh, the key into social media space, given its fragmentation from our perspective for brands in particular and real world products, is you kind of need to be a lot of places. Because the demographics, just to kind of answer the question directly, virtual worlds skew younger, you know, tend to be te teens and tweeners. Casual gaming, the average gamer last time I checked is a 43-year-old married woman with, with two kids and a household income of about $78,000. Social networks, you know, it's a high-class problem. Increasingly, the demographic is the connected world, right? So you can find your demographic now in the social media space much more easily. And then as far as overcoming kind of purchase barriers, you know, one thing, we're biased, but we see what brands do in the online community is what they do in the real world. They, they drive traffic. They, they increase price points. They, they, command, um, they, they command much more loyalty. Uh, and you have higher buy rates. Those are all good things for whether it's physical or virtual. Yep. Uh, we've got one more question right here. Hi, uh, my name is Parveen. I'm a developer at eBay. Uh, question is, uh, you talked about moving from the virtual world to the, uh, to the physical world when uh, suppose you like an avatar and you like the hat that the avatar is wearing. You go to the physical world, you might be interested in buying that. How about the vice versa? I mean, I have, I have a personality outside. I like my personality. I want the same thing to be replicated on the avatar that I am now using. 
right? So, or I can even rent out my avatar if that uh, my friends like my avatar. So, is there is there anything on that lines? Yeah, I. Th that's the big win. I mean, there's there's an opportunity, I, a, a great untapped opportunity that we're willing to talk to any retailers who are interested in exploring, where hang tags could absolutely unlock premium virtual goods of the exact same outfit or some other bonus item in the virtual space. So that I think that you're really onto something. I think you you want to have that, and I think I think. You know, yeah, we skew young in the virtual world space, but I think that's just because they're most likely to understand what that's all about. But they're the buyers of tomorrow. And don't you think that the retailers that can kind of wake up to that and understand that, boy, if I can create something unique and not been done before, where, you know, you're at Old Navy or something and the hang tag allows you to unlock a virtual item, very interesting. So I think that's a very um, exciting thing that we'd like to move into. Yeah, one, right now. one thing I'd encourage you to remember, it all sounds fully baked up here when these folks talk, but we're still very early right. into something, right? Uh, but what we have is we have a very attractive demographic who are mainstreaming um, their online presence with their real world presence. And where it's going to go, if somebody knows, please let me know, because I'm, I'm not sure. All I know is that the dollars are flowing in, the demographics are attractive. Um, our virtual products can be inspired by the real world, but not by constrained by them. You know, maybe those shoes can make you fly. That might help your, your real world sales. So I guess one of my closing thoughts is it's early, um, but boy, it's trending in a great direction. And if you're a brand, you know, uh, get into it. So I wanted to thank the panel for this great conversation. Um, and I, I started this conversation by talking a little bit about my experiences at, at F8 and the interaction on Facebook. But I think what these panelists have shown, what the speakers have shown, is just that there are a myriad of ways um, to bring brands online and, and to bring that collision between uh, physical and digital to enhance your business and your brand. Um, and I'm sure that I'm joined by the panelists here in saying that you know I can't wait to see where this goes next because, as Dan said, it's early. And I think there's a ton of opportunity here. Um, so thank you, thank you all for, and thank you all for attending. Thank you.